Good evening. Welcome to the second public forum on sponsored by the Northampton Special Act Charter Drafting Committee. We have been given the charge to look at Northampton City Charter and to do a comprehensive rewrite. Our due date is January 13th, where we have to turn our material over to City Council. Uh, the first slide you see up there talks about a committee that was formed in 2010 from the Ordinance Committee. Uh, from the ordinance, and they recommended this process begin. We have hired Steve McGoldrick from the Collins Institute at UMass in Boston, who has been a, our facilitator of this discussion, and Mary Madurda is our um, staff person taking notes tonight. My name is Dave Stevens, and I've been asked to chair this committee. Our timelines, as you see down there, we started meeting in mid-October, and by mid-January, uh, again, we have to have our report to City Council. The process then would go to City Council by uh, January and February, so they could put a report out in, in mid-March to go to the legislature, who would then also need to vote on this. Uh, it would go to the governor's desk, and then to the um, Secretary of the Commonwealth, Bill Gallon's office, who would need to vet it as well. If they approve, it would go on our November ballot for all citizens to vote on in November of 2012. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce our committee members, and we'll start over with Mark, and tell us what ward you're from. Mark Warner, Ward 5. Uh, Bill Scher, Ward 4. Megan Murphy-Wolf, I'm at large. Dave Stevens, I'm at large. Gail Cronin, Ward 1. Uh, Tom Thompson, Ward 2. Madeline weaver Blanchett, Ward 3. Tom Miranda, Ward 6. And I note the absence of Richard Green from Ward 7, who unfortunately is home uh, with pneumonia. You want to introduce yourself? Mary Madura, I'm the Executive Secretary of City Council and Justice Committee. Again, our, dra our draft of our, our committee, um, our charter is was written in the 1880s. As we reported in the last public forum's PowerPoint, which is posted online and you can read, there have been several incremental changes, but a comprehensive reviews of our charter have not been successful. So we have been asked to do a comprehensive review because there are certain things in the charter that at this point in time probably should not be in the charter. There are things that need to be updated, and there are things that are missing. So we hope to accomplish that process again by mid-January. I take note that we have this PowerPoint is will, is online already. It is uh, hard copies there on the desk along with the agenda for those who would like to read along with us. And I now want to turn it over to Gail Perlman, who gave us an overview of what the charter process should be involved. Dave asked me to um, repeat remarks that I made at the last public meeting, so for any of you who were there at that one, I apologize for, for some of the repetition. But this was just a, a, a bit of an introduction to sort of get our mindset in place for how we go about our task on this, on this committee. We've talked a lot about our mission. Sometimes we say we're trying to write a document that's like Northampton's Constitution, because that's really what the charter is. It's the guiding document for the town. Um, and as Dave says, the last time that was tried was over 100 years ago. So we're hoping that we can make some recommendations for a charter that will be uh, strong and sturdy enough to take us through another 100 years. That's a pretty good order. The task itself has been reminding me of a mistake that I used to make when I was new to the workforce and trying to run an office. I would find myself hiring new staff or setting new policy based on something that had just gone wrong, something that had just occurred, something recent and immediate in my mind. And it took me a while to figure out that if I kept going with that kind of narrow focus, I would never grow the business. The big vision would never come true. I would always just be tinkering. So we're asking you to join us in not making my mistakes and um, look, looking big. Take, think about the big ideas. Think about the big picture. That's what this process is really, is really about. And it's especially going to be important that we do that tonight because we're looking at some, some issues tonight that have to do with elections and procedures that citizens have for, for having access to their government. Um, 
those are issues that citizens usually feel pretty strongly about. Our job, I think, is going to be to think about each of the issues that comes up tonight in two different ways. First, is if a candidate or an issue that we support were the subjects of the proposed charter change, and then think about it again as if a candidate or an issue that we didn't support were the subject of the proposed charter change. Because whatever goes into the final charter applies to every candidate and every issue, and we need to get our minds around um, the big picture. Now we don't have the luxury really of getting stuck and feelings that we may have had about a recent election or recent issue. So with that kind of what I'll call nonpartisan analysis, we welcome you tonight and hope you'll help us create a charter that will serve our great grandchildren in this amazing city. I want to thank our bank from cable TV who is filming this. It will be run on their loop. Uh, channel 12 and 15, we hope that people take advantage of it. We also like to thank the North Street Association, who is not only filming this, as, but they have also filmed our meetings. And you can go to the North Street Association website and take a look at the meetings uh, that we've held so far. To that, we've had several meetings, and we've had Steve McGoldrick work us through the charter. And we have uh, red flagged or highlighted several areas that we felt we needed to get more comment from in specific areas. On this charter on the, on the 15th, we, ha we ask these five areas and comments from the public on that, on the five areas you see up there, like the number of city councils and, and school committee members, the length of term, should there be term limits, compensation for our elected officials, should the mayor preside over a city council or school committee, and should the city clerk be elected. Those were the first five uh, hot topics that we wanted your feedback on. Tonight we've picked an additional four areas um, to talk about, and you can see those highlighted in bold up here, which is the temporary absence of the mayor, the vacancy in, in the office of the mayor, the nominations and election procedures, and the procedures for free petition, initiative petition, referendum, and recall. The other things listed on that agenda we're going to hold off and deal with a little later in tonight's forum, but we're going to begin with those four. We would like your input to those. On the um, podium is a list for you to sign in. If you're interested in signing in any of those uh, areas, please do. We're going to take them one at a time. Each of us will run that for approximately a half hour. We will then conclude with other agenda items on the charter that have not been discussed for about a half hour. And then if time permits, the last half hour will be for any reflections that people have had on any of the other areas. So tonight we, we're going to begin with temporary absence of the mayor. Um, I refer you to the next slide which gives you the public who are not here tonight the opportunity to follow all of this uh, that has been documented and to submit any questions or comments. Uh, it gives you both of those sites. And then I show you that uh, in the next slide, the target dates to submit the report is January 13th with the follow-up dates, and we'll talk about that as we get to the end of the agenda. So the temporary absence of the mayor, this slide was written by Richard Green. Again, we hope that he gets well quickly, but um, this is having to do with the temporary absence of a mayor. Uh, in this electronic age, we seem to be able to be in contact with our mayors, even if they're on vacation. But if there was for some reason that the mayor was inaccessible and not able to do the business of the mayor, we talk about um, this as an acting mayor and a temporary absence. Whenever by reasons of sickness or absence from the city or other causes, the mayor shall be unable to perform the duties of the office and the president of the city council shall be acting mayor. Um, we talk about some of the qualifications in there. This is proposed language, indispensably essential. Um, uh, they'd have the power to move forward in any business that was indispensably essential. They wouldn't have authority to appoint or remove any employees. Um, and then, while they're serving as acting mayor, it has been suggested that they shall not be a member of the, or be a voting member of the city council. That they would be acting mayor, and not also city council president. So they would not be the role of the two votes. Some of the questions that Richard read uh, are asked in the, the next slide, and we'd like your input on plus anything within that realm of temporary absence. We're going to talk about a long-term absence or, or a resignation in the next portion. 
but this is just a temporary action piece, act, absence piece. Should the council president be able to assume the role? Who would be next in line? Um, and then should there be a vice president of the council even to be able to fill in? And who would, uh, how would they choose that uh, person to take over? And then the powers of the acting mayor, um, uh, we talked about this in the proposal, it says no, that they couldn't vote, but we just want your comments on that because there's concern about what happens if it's a tie vote. So those are sort of the areas that we'd like you to focus on. If you have other areas around temporary absence, please come up and sign the petition or sign the, the statement. And uh, who was on the first one on there, Gene? Anybody? Uh, power, uh, Anthony Patillo. Is it temporary absence or? No, especially that was the, oh, I'm sorry. No, nope, it's not. Is that the temporary one? Does anyone want to speak to the temporary absence of a mayor? I didn't think this was going to be a hot topic, but we probably it. <laughs> Don't feel shy. I mean, come on up. All right. Then what we're going to do is, if there are people at home that have feelings about this, the way that should be structured, the way the charter should be written, uh, we suggest that you send your writing in again to Mary. It'll be part of the record. We'll review that before we start making decisions. At this point in time, I want to turn it over um, to our next section and our next piece, Tom Miranda, who's going to be handling filling the vacancy of the mayor if there was a resignation. So, Tom, out to your left. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the reason that we thought that this should be on the agenda is because of the recent uh, uh, resignation by Mayor Higgins and then the uh, president of the city council uh, taking uh, the position. Uh, and although this doesn't happen very often, I thought that uh, we should go through what would happen uh, in the event that there is a long-term uh, absence or vacancy in the position and uh, the president of the city council would serve until there is a next election. And then the question becomes, should we have a special election to uh, uh, to fill the vacancy. And that would depend in, uh, in our mind, or at least mine, as to what the term that remains would be. So for example, if, uh, and, and then we also have to, have to go back and forth on this because there's, there's some uh, uh, question as to whether or not we're going to talk about a two-year or four-year term. But for example, if we do have a two-year term in the mayor, uh, and within the first several months, there's a vacancy, uh, illness, death, uh, for whatever reason, the mayor must, must uh, resign for personal reasons or no longer available, uh, then how long uh, should remain uh, in the term before we have a special election? And so uh, if, if it's less than uh, six months, for example, and you have a vacancy in the office, by the time you have a special election, it would probably be two or three months, and then the person elected would only serve for the remainder of the term, which would be three months. However, if you get to a year or more, and you had a, do you really want to have the president of the city council uh, serve as mayor for a, full, for a full year without the ability of the voters to uh, make a choice? And so as you come down, you look at um, what are the pros and the cons of a special election. Well, the pros are uh, citizen participation and the choice of the mayor, and the uh, president of the city council will only serve for a limited period of time. The, co the cons uh, that uh, I could think of in talking with a few other people, the only con that we could come up with is uh, the estimated cost, which uh, in today's uh, world we're told is approximately fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So. That's what we're talking about here. If anybody has any, any thoughts or any comments, uh, we'd like to hear them. You have your list in front of you if you want to call the first name. Tony, is that you on this? Yes. Go ahead. Hello, Anthony Patillo, Florence Mass. Um, I, I just wish we would have clarity um, in 
our charter as far as the vacancy goes. There's been discussion uh, of extending the mayor's term to four years, and if that happened, I think we really do need clarity. We also need clarity if it's more than six months that, that are left in the term. As far as cost goes, I think it's the citizen's right to be able to elect their mayor, to have a person who's not duly elected mayor taking over for that position by charter as opposed to uh, citizens' vote, I think is acrimonious, to say the least. And I would strongly recommend or support something that would say if, if there were nine or six months left on the term, uh, that they would have to have a special election. To leave it in terms in the hands of the city council for future generations, I feel is incorrect. And that should be looked at and clarified. And when you say clarity, you mean clarity in the, in the language and of the, the charter? In the language. The way that we've got it now, it says after, after being sworn in the faith, for faithful performance of their duties, the members of the city council shall organize by electing from among them a president who shall preside at all meetings and of city council and act in the absence of the mayor and shall act, in, shall act as mayor in case of vacancy in the office. And then below that, there are clear terms for a city councilor. If a city councilor dies through death or recognition, they shall hold an immediate election. It seems kind of counterintuitive that you would hire, you would have a special election for city council, but not for the mayor. That doesn't, that just doesn't fly, logically. And I'd like to see that corrected. Okay. And do you have a feeling as to what? period of time uh, would be appropriate to have a special election uh, depending on how long was left in the term. For example, if it was the, the recent uh, situation where there was a few months left in the term, do you think that there should have been a special election at that point? I, I believe that there should have, there should have been. Um, we're looking at cost and I guess logic would say nine to six, there are nine months left on the term that there should be, or someplace between nine and six months. But I, I think that it leaves open a lot of backdoor discussions that can occur out of the public's ear, and that's not in the public's favor. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a quick point of clarification, I believe that the mayor resigned at the beginning of September. The, um, and her term would have ended the beginning of January, so there's a four-month window on this last incident that people are commenting on. So people who want to further comment on that, I think it would be helpful for us to understand if you feel that that was too long or too short, that we needed to put an election in there, or that four months was a short enough time that it could have just been the way it was handled. I'd like to comment in terms of your, of your clarifying. The one of the drafts that we have been looking at provides, in essence, that whenever this special election is held, uh, upon determination of the results, the person that's elected at the special election immediately takes office. So there's not a, a one month or two month uh, waiting period. It would happen upon uh, the certification of the, of the election results. I believe that would be a smart move. Yeah. Owen. Freeman Daniels. Evening. I didn't expect to be speaking on this particular matter, but I agree with uh, Mr. Patillo in almost every circumstance. Uh, the timing, I, I don't think I, that's right for me to comment on, uh, apropos of uh, the comments said earlier today. I mean, I don't think that we should be looking at the immediate last few months in making a determination for a charter that's going to last 100 years. Four months, six months, eight months, whatever it is, I think that the citizens do have a right to elect a mayor. Uh, and um, it, it's, it's a, it, an obvious parity issue if you're going to elect a city councilor. City councilors have much less power than the mayor. Um, this is a representative democracy. You should be able to elect a mayor, too. Uh, I had wanted to do comments about the other powers of the executive branch, so I'll wait for those for later. Thank you. Gene? Yeah. I just wanted to just, I won't reiterate or say what Tony said, but uh, I didn't talk to him before I came here, but he said exactly what I was going to say. Um, but I would think something like four months um, for a special election. I know we have six months for city council. Um, and I kept looking through there, and I thought it was going to, I thought there would be some six-month indication in there. And as I kept reading it and reading it, 
It was nothing. But there really should be something. And uh, I won't take any more of your time. I know it'll be a long meeting. So your suggestion is if there's four months, at least four months left on the term, that there should be a special election? Maybe four months or three months. I would leave it up to you. But at least something to give you some, something you can sink your teeth into, something you can read. When you say you leave it up to us, we it just require. Oh, I get it. <laughs> we just we just make we're going to present something to the city council. Yeah. The city council can slice and dice it any way that they want. They may yeah. not come out. I know you'll provide a recommend. recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I didn't, yes. Is there anyone else? Um, I, my name is Barry Roth. I live in Florence. I'd just like to put out there for your consideration that whoever uh, acts as the acting mayor um, will agree not to run for office. Uh, just put it out there for thought. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm Bill Dwight, Northampton, on Myrtle Street. Um, actually, Point of clarification: What is, what's the threshold for a special election for a councilor, if a councilor leaves? I believe someone said six months. Six, six months. months. I think you should attach it to that, principally because, if you have, the, council president serving as the mayor, then you, in effect, lost a councilor for, uh, that because that councilor cannot vote, and the councilor cannot serve and represent the people who voted for that councilor. And I don't. And it seems that the criteria that were considered relative to your concerns, Tom, about um, you know being too short or too long, were already considered when uh, they were trying when when the previous drafters of the charter were trying to figure out what would be the longest time we can endure that would make sense without a counselor should be applied the same as mayor. And because I mean. I, Given the fact that you have a city councilor serving as a mayor and not being able to serve as a councilor, there is that absence. So it would make sense. It would rhyme. It, it wouldn't. Uh, the same threshold would apply, and, and and they all seem to make sense. Yeah, that. it, it, that's a good point. It does make sense. So in essence, you'd have two elections: one for the vacant council seat, unless the right, unless the president city council was not going to run, right, and then one for mayor. Right. Good point. Thank you. Uh, for clarification. Yes. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think right now in the charter, it is not spelled out that the acting mayor does not also continue to serve as the council president. I believe it's vague. Yeah. So, the, so the council president is interim mayor may also vote on... I mean, uh, technically speaking, yes. It's not well, that, spelled out. I mean, that would, that would, that would, would you change. I think that would be. I think it's one of those things that it's an old charter. It didn't spell out impossible circumstances. Right. I think right now, I, I don't think I don't think uh, Kurt Mayor Narkowitz did that and right. played both roles. But I think he could have technically. Right. Well, that's clearly a, an important consideration. I think given given and, and if he or she is serving as council president and wearing two hats as council president and a, and a councilor with a vote. And as the executive, your separation of powers is getting thinner and thinner. So, and I think this particular issue highlights one of the reasons we need comprehensive charter change, because there's a lot of very gray areas, of very areas that are open to interpretation, and that's the last thing a charter should be. A charter should be black and white. We know exactly what's happening. We know what our options would be at a time when there would be a temporary or a permanent absence. And there was a lot of discussion in recent years about clarifying this language. So this is a good example of why we're going through this process and need to produce a document that we can clean up the city charter. Back to our, our chair of this area. Is there anyone else has a comment? Yes, sir. I, I just uh, have a point of information. I would just like to ask a question. Uh, since um, the president of the council one can imagine he has a full-time job. He or she would have a full-time job. How does it work in the system where the mayor has as much responsibility as one does? There's not a paid professional that runs our town. Um, and let's say the council, the, the president of the council takes over. Let's say he's a doctor in one of the hospitals, or she's a doctor. How? I just wonder what what is the thinking on that. I I just don't know how that works. Thank you. We did discuss it in one of our meetings, and that's uh, that's a good point. The the way that the the draft uh, 
that we have that we've been looking at is worded, uh, and there's some vagary in this in terms of how we deal with it, but the mayor would be precluded from having a full-time job. And uh, then we come to the question, well, what is a full-time job? There are, plenty, there are a number of people that uh, are independent uh, workers. They work on their own. They have their own uh, they're entrepreneurs. And uh, they, may, they may have a retail business. They may own rental property. But that's their livelihood. So the question that we've been, one of the things that we've been struggling with, how do you present a uh, proposal that uh, would not preclude someone from uh, running for mayor, but uh, who ostensibly could be able to continue with their own private business, but somebody that was employed as uh, on a salary position would have to give that position up. And then the question was whether or not the president of city council who assumes the position of the mayor, uh, would that person uh, have the same constraints? And the way that the draft was, was given to us um, indicates that maybe the president of city council would not have to give up their full-time job. Now these are things that, that we're, we're talking about and we certainly welcome comment uh, in light of that from anyone. Could the last speaker identify himself for public record, please? Yes, Joel Spire, Ward 3. If I could just make uh, one comment. Tom had mentioned the draft that's been circulating. There actually isn't a draft. We, we were handed a template um, to look at of a, of a model charter um, for a city. And we've been led through this template. It's not a draft. We haven't drafted anything yet. We're just trying to wrap our heads around the different issues. So I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that we haven't drafted anything. We're in the process of collecting information. We will start drafting in a few weeks, I think. Thank you. I stand here. Also, he, he's correct. can I add that I think that Steve said that, that, it, that uh, he doesn't know of any other town that then allows that city, correct me if I'm wrong, but allows that city uh, acting mayor to take on the salary of the mayor. So then that person is in fact left with a full-time job without a salary for a full-time job and unable to do their outside job. So it is... <laughs> it's, a it's a difficult situation yeah. and, and, and it begs for a a special election within a, a short period of time. Other comments in this area? Gene, I saw your hand. Yeah. The, the importance of the acting mayor and council president, um, it was pretty apparent uh, during this last election. Uh, I had 100 people ask me, why in the Christ is he still council president if he's acting mayor? I said, because the charter says if he resigns as Council President, he's no longer the acting mayor. <laughs> well, really, and, I, and I, I, couldn't ex I could not explain that to people. No matter how hard I tried, they would walk. They walked away from me, and they says, "Well, that's stupid." <laughs> no, so, but it's not. It's just something that you know has over time, and that's how it's come up. So it's uh, and, and our past council presidents have all had full time jobs. Um, so it's just it, it, it is. It's a very important item in that charter. So uh, thank you very much. When you take a document that's 130 years old and you keep tinkering with it without a comprehensive review, there are many times that certain sections conflict with other sections. So this work is to clean the whole thing up. Other issues from Tom? Any other thoughts, questions? Thank you. The next section we wanted to highlight and get some feedback on uh, was uh, the nominations and elections. And we're dividing this into two areas, I'm turning it over to Mark to lead us through that discussion. Okay. I want to break it up into two parts here. One, the process of an individual to become a candidate to get on the ballot. Then the second part about how the public would choose among those candidates and who's going to take the office. This first part shows the signature requirements, which is really all it takes to get on the ballot. Right now it shows, what I've got here in this chart are the three cities that all have a, a mayor and a nine-member city council that are about the same size and population in Northampton. And you can see that across the board, uh, looking down, the requirement in Northampton is that candidates, individuals have to get 50 signatures, regardless of the office they're running for. And that in looking at the other ones, there are other cities, of course, in the same size as ours, 
uh, 100 for mayor in West Springfield, 300 in Gloucester, and the other positions, you know, uh, councilor at large, uh, two or three times as much as in Northampton, school committee, the same thing. There's also a note here that in West Springfield, there's a further requirement that uh, you have a maximum of 25 from any individual ward for the candidates for mayor. So that's one way of looking at it. You might also have something where you're reducing, where you're requiring at least 25 signatures from each of the individual wards. So there are a variety of permutations you might want to consider in how you'd lay this out. The idea, of course, is that you're talking about more signatures is a way of discouraging frivolous candidates, people who are not going to take the election serious, seriously. On the other hand, it becomes a bit of a pain for those people who do intend to take the election seriously and really would seek to, to serve legitimately for the city. So looking at that, is there an optimal number? Uh, is there, uh, should there be some minimum number of signatures or maximum number of signatures for individual wards? And there's another note about this too. This is maybe a, an anachronistic old legacy, but the petition that candidates have to present to potential signatories is that uh, includes the statement we further state that we believe him to be of good moral character and qualified to perform the duties of the office. And I wondered if, if people, given this, seeing this uh, signature form standing, well, standing in front of the stop and shop, because, well, wait a minute, I don't know this guy, but I'm sure that they get the signatures anyway. And I'm, according to Wendy Mazza, the city clerk, people haven't, candidates haven't particularly groused to her, at least, about this. But I'm sure it has, must have come up at least a few times people who have been asked to sign the forms. So is this an anachronism, this last thing? Uh, and is there a need for more signatures? And one other thing to think about, is there a better way to do this? If, only the, if the only purpose of the signatures is really to go and weed out the uh, initial candidates, um, you know, those serious candidates from those who aren't so serious, and may just be adding additional persons such that you're now going to need a preliminary election at $15,000 each time, is there a better way to do that? Is there some other measure that might be appropriate to ask of these individuals who are running for office to establish the seriousness of their <coughs> tendencies? So, um, is there a list here of people who want to speak? There's no one on the list. Okay. Does anyone want to speak to just getting signatures uh, or the points about the, the three points on the bottom? Anybody want to speak to this particular point? Come on up to the I get the 50 signatures to run in about, no kidding, about a half an hour. They came to my house. So I don't know what to say uh, about the rest of them. Is optimal optimal number? I don't know. Um, but I do think uh, 100 signatures would not be cumbersome, would not be um, anything that would turn anybody off. Um, but 50 does not seem to be a barrier, a serious barrier to entry. For yeah. Average candidate. I get it. I I, um, I don't know. I think uh, 50 or 100, uh, you can probably get 100 in, in pretty short order also. So I don't know where the, I don't know where West Springfield came up with their 100 number, uh, how they came about it. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. Um, but uh, 50 signatures is, is never a problem to get Jeez. for anyone. Is there any difference between? what you should collect for an at-large school committee or city councilor or mayor versus a ward councilor? Should there be a difference in number that way? Well, I do like the idea of getting signatures out of every ward if you're going to run for at-large. It makes you get around. It makes you be more serious. It makes you travel the wards before you even get on the ballot. Um, maybe you just know people in all of the wards and just call them or something. But it does make it, it the more work you spend at it to get on the ballot, the more serious you, uh, of a candidate you are. So, thank you. Uh, the, the one good thing about the signatures is the one aspect of campaigning doesn't cost you a cent. It doesn't require money in order to do do at least try to garner some support or some sense of your prospects as a candidate. I think, you know, as a as a process of calling out people, I think it's, it's the initial foray into doing, as Gene said, is going out and, and soliciting the public. I think 50 should be higher because anyone, most folks can conjure up 50 pretty easily, and I think it doesn't require them to 
to talk to many people about many of the issues. As they, uh, one of the things when, when I would gather signatures or other counselors, we, we would go door to door. That's the, one of the most daunting prospects of any campaign, and, and this actually sort of compels you. And, and I think to that extent, it keeps the honest people honest and the people with, with the genuine intent as opposed to losing a bar bet and, and running for office. But the, and I think the threshold should be more than 50 because, if, for instance, uh, in Salvo House, you could literally gather all your signatures in Salvo House if you wanted to, and you don't know, you don't get a sense of anything beyond that one particular point. And I, I, I would also, as to the last statement, I think, I think it is kind of cute and antiquated and really doesn't apply because you're also talking to people who have no idea who you are. And for that to be one of the circumstances, usually when I make the case, I said, this is not to endorse me, this isn't supporting me, this is just giving me the opportunity to make my case. And so you shouldn't expect me to be of good moral character because you have no idea. I just came to your door. You never expect that of anybody who comes to your door. So I, I would, I like the idea of increasing. And I also agree that I think that if you're running at large, and if you're running for mayor, if you're running across the city, you should uh, solicit signatures from every ward. And if you're running, obviously, in a specific ward, it should be ward specific as well. Uh, going back uh, several elections, uh, Mayor Claire Higgins had entertained the idea of requiring more vote, more <coughs> signatures for mayor because uh, there was a candidate who ran and only got 2 or 3% of the vote. And uh, it was disruptive when it came time to debate because he had ceased to be, uh, a vi at one point in his first run, he had gotten 30% of the vote. Subsequent elections, he only got 2 to 3% of the vote. And it was disruptive to the debates that took place between the two, uh, what I consider to, at the time to have been more serious candidates. Just a point. Anybody else? Okay. Second part of this is that, well, once the candidates have been established, got their names on the ballot, there are a couple of things the city has to, uh, has to do. If One of them has to do with regard to preliminary elections. The current charter calls for preliminary election if the number of candidates is more than twice the number of open seats. So if there are more than two people running for mayor, you have to have a preliminary election. If there are more than four candidates running for the two at-large positions, you have to have a preliminary election. We came very close to that this last, uh, last election. The, um, the idea of this is that you send a limited number of candidates to the general election. And uh, this way, at least for the mayor, you assure that the person who gets elected mayor is going to have at least 50% uh, plus one uh, of the total votes cast. And to some extent, it also reduces the op opportunity for a candidate to become a spoiler. So if you have a, if you have a third candidate who is very similar to a second candidate, that guy might, these two people might go and split the vote, and the third candidate, perhaps only with 37% or so of the uh, potential support, might get elected mayor. This way, if one of those candidates happens to get wintered out, you are sure that, uh, that one of these, that that other candidate is going to have a, a, a full proper screening. Flip side of this is that it adds expense of an additional election. And this is, um, there was, a, looking back over the last 14 years here in Northampton, there have been seven municipal elections which the city had to run a preliminary. So once every other year. It's not the full expense, depending upon, as you might have for a full citywide election, because some of these are only going to be in a particular ward. And you have, a, in any case, a, a smaller slate of, uh, of campaign workers who you'd have to, the city would have to get. But there is still you know, $5,000, $10,000 that the city is incurring for each one of these. Um, so is the preliminary election worth the cost? Do we accept these? Uh, seven times in 14 years as just a, a cost of doing business? Um, or should we just uh, put all the people into the general election, regardless of the number of candidates who appear on the ballot? The second part here, so we'll talk to that in a minute, but there's a second, the second part of this, um, is that there is another way we might want to consider this, and that is instant runoff voting. And this is an idea where instead of having the candidate with the single highest number of votes, regardless of whether that person got 50% or only 35% of the total votes cast, 
become the elected person, imagine if you were then asked to go and rank your candidates, rank your choices among all the people who were, vote, who were uh, putting themselves forward as candidates. And this example shows that, you know, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington, that if you had a ballot that looked like this, you could then have multiple, more than just two candidates, and that you could then winnow this process down to identifying who has the most support among all the votes cast. So what happens is the person with the lowest number of votes gets removed from, the, if nobody gets 50% plus one, the person with the lowest number of votes, the first place votes, gets removed, and that person's second place votes then get distributed to the other candidates. And then if you still don't have any person who's reached more than 50%, then you keep going down and you keep following this process until you establish that who is uh, who's the remaining candidate. So this has the same effect of being able to, actually a little more strongly, of removing somebody who could potentially be a spoiler. Uh, and the next slide, if you want, you can push ahead to that one. This shows some of the strengths and weaknesses. You have avoided that expense of a preliminary election or a runoff. It uh, assures that the winning candidate gets at least a 50% plus 1% of the votes, gets full uh, majority support, and it prevents a minor candidate from becoming a spoiler. That's another example. The flip side is, well, it's, it's new. It's a little bit confusing to some voters. There some, has been antagonism in this idea in other places. And there might be some expense to adjust the voting machines, but it is a, it's not something that would add up over time or be comparable to the cost of preliminary elections. Note, too, that instant runoff voting does have precedence. Uh, Portland, Maine, San Francisco, Oakland, Minneapolis, St. Paul currently use this for their municipal elections. Cambridge has a, a variant of this. Uh, and then there are some other places internationally that have used this as well. So those are two issues here on this side of it. Uh, the question of should we accept a preliminary, uh, should you still have a preliminary election at that ratio of more than two candidates for any open spot? And is there support? Would there be a support in Northampton for instant runoff voting to suggest that it's worth further consideration? <coughs> Anybody show up on this? <laughs> okay. Gene? The preliminary vote in the primary. Um, it's been said throughout the city that had the mayoral race, not this past election, but the prior election, if it didn't have a primary, it would have had a different outcome. In the preliminary, the incumbent lost by 500 votes. <laughs> Mobilized the troops after the primary and saw just exactly what was happening. And then in the general election, won by 300 votes. So it's been said that had there not been a primary, we would have had a different mayor because everything would have just went as it was. That being said, and that's, that is the word <laughs> about the wards, the, the runoff election, voting should be as simple as possible because people are afraid to vote. Never has anybody in the city of Northampton been elected by the majority of registered voters. They've always been elected by the majority of those that voted. We all know that. I know people that are 45 or 50 years old that have never voted, and I ask them why, and they say, well, I don't know how. And, they're afraid, and some of them are afraid to say that they've never voted, and they don't know how, but they just don't, and they don't come out and vote. Um, Ward 7 had the highest uh, number of, had the highest percentage of voters that came out and voted. I believe it was 52 percent. I think it's pretty important. I never missed a chance to vote, I mean, <laughs> vote. Um, but anyway, so it, the runoff, make voting as simple as possible. And as you get competent, people have to think about what they're doing when they're voting, when they really have to think about arranging candidates in a line. I don't know if that... Um, it might be easy for me to do, or you to do, or anybody on this panel to do, but it might not be so simple for everybody to do. So, um, whether you believe it or not, it's true. Voting is a daunting task for some people. They're scared of it. Gene, we, we had that sort of discussion about the roundabout that went up at Look Park, and yep. there was a lot of fear and concern about the complexity of that roundabout. After three or four months, my sense is that people love it. 
question. Are, are you saying we shouldn't move this direction because it might create some anxiety amongst a small percentage of the population initially? You can't, you can't disenfranchise or cast aside any percentage of the population when it comes to voting. When it comes to a project, a construction project in the city, there are engineers, there are people involved that actually know just exactly what is going on. And we know they do because they're certified. But as far as voting goes, make it as simple as possible. You cannot disenfranchise anybody. You can't discount any percentage of the public when it comes to the vote. That's their right. So if they're scared to vote now, when it's as simple as it is to connect the arrow, don't make it any more difficult. Um, um, I'll preface this by saying it was brought up by the consultant at our last meeting that it might be wise to not do a wholesale election change in the charter, uh, which could, which in itself would be very complicated. You could put in the charter of uh, some recommendation to study it further and have it be a separate process if there was to be a change. Be that as it may. Yep. Uh, if um, you, you, you're indicating there's a concern about low voter turnout. Uh, I don't believe that the turnout this last election was, was uniquely low. It was, a, it was around 50%. That's pretty typical yeah. for our local elections. So there's no, there's no panic crisis drop. Yeah. But still, uh, some would say that's not good enough and should be higher. Are there ideas that you or others have bandied about to raise turnout levels? I'm going to make a serious effort in Ward 7 to educate people on, on voting. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know. When they, they've never walked into the voting, so they don't know that you walk in and you give your address, and then you know your street and your address and your name, and they give you a and they check you off, and then you run around to this, you fill in your, and you run around and you, they take your name and address again. It's the simplest thing in the world, but people have never done it. They're afraid of it. Should we think of things like mail-in voting or compulsory voting to try to increase turnout? I am thinking of just maybe a forum or something at the, at a school or something like that to try and educate, but do something. And I haven't figured out just exactly what yet. But back to your point about the roundabout and people voting on different uh, things and not liking being afraid of something. I built uh, nine subdivisions in the city of Northampton. Every single one of them. Hugely controversial in the neighborhood. And then they're built. And a year after that, everybody's happy as heck with them. Shepherd Hollow or, or Terra Circle and Matthew Drive, those subdivisions. Very controversial, but the, so the voting part, you know, just after it's over with and people see what it's like, they like it. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that because that's, that's one of the things that happens. Um, change. I'm pretty resistant to change. So, but I build a lot of subdivisions and I change a lot of things in the city, but I know these are affordable homes that we built. The first one I built, the first cluster development in the city. So that's one thing. So all this stuff, it, it all it all plays a part. So when you get into the elections, it's a tough. You have a daunting task, and uh, everything that you do, everything is related that happens in the city with this. Let me just, if I could follow up briefly. You, I know also that you're sort of a fiscal hawk as well. Do you have any opinion about the expense of a preliminary election? Um, whether there are more efficient ways to do this, as, as Mark was outlining? It's going to cost, it's going to cost the, we, we looked at it several times, it's going to cost $15,000 to hold a plenary election. There's really no way around that. And whether or not um, it's right, it's the, it's the right of uh, people to vote. Um, and so when the charter is put together, the council will look at it, and I'm sure that is going to come up, the amount of money that it costs to hold a preliminary election. So. The number of signatures might slow that down too. I'd like to move on because I know there are other people who would like to speak yeah. in this area and we have 10 minutes remaining Thank theoretically you. in this section. Anybody else? No. Owen? Owen. Owen Freeman Daniels, 53 Woodmont Road. Uh, I am a supporter of an alternate voting system, instant runoff or uh, range voting or whatever it happens to be. I believe just tactically it's probably unwise to put it into the new charter since we're on a pretty stiff timeline to get it on the ballot for 2012 and this is this could be a, a major stumbling block for passage and if you're going to put a lot of other great reforms into a charter you really should keep it uh, not do necessarily a wholesale election change however I do believe that um, 
whenever you have a, an election, you want to get the most information from the voters as possible. Instant runoff voting, range voting, rank choice voting, that is more information coming to the representatives than before. And that's always good. I can't imagine that elected officials wouldn't want more information from their constituents. So I'm a, I'm a big supporter of it, but I wouldn't suggest it strategically. Thank you. Uh, just first a question. When are pre preliminary elections held in the city? 28 to 45 days before the general election. Okay. Usually the third week of December, in September. Okay. Um, I agree that I think instant runoff voting is a very good idea. I also don't think it would be that hard for people to learn, especially uh, considering that most people at school learn how to fill out bubbles and standardize <laughs> tests. I don't think making the line would be that hard. Um, and if, you know, I think it's the responsibility of the people to learn how to do that, and I think we should make it as easy as it, like, it is to for somebody to learn that, but I don't think it could be that hard. Um, and I also think that having more candidates in that general election is not a bad thing. I think it's a part of our bias of the, we have two parties, Democrat, Republican, to have a general election with only two candidates, but I don't think it's bad. I think we can have, I think four people running in a general election would be a good limit. Um, um, then at a preliminary election, or if you do run off, I guess it could change. I'm not really sure what it would look like if you do run off voting in the uh, charter, so I don't know strategically what that's like. So. Okay. Um. I think the instant runoff is a good idea, and I think uh, what will probably happen practically is a person will just vote for the one candidate they know, as opposed to trying to sort out what might be for them a difficult task. Yeah, same folks, I guess. The, uh, the, I'm, I'm actually also a big fan of instant runoff voting. I think it's it's the most equitable way to advance a candidacy. The other thing that I would ask you not to consider, though, when, when deliberating this is expense. I mean, the expense really shouldn't be one of the criteria on what you decide whether to have a preliminary or not. Uh, the, I mean, the important fact, regardless of expense, is access for the voters to vote. And if you make a decision based on that, it, it, it tends to dirty up the conversation, I think. So I would remove that from the conversation. The expense, be damned, it's going to fluctuate regardless. There is no premium price for advancing public discussion and public voting. But at the same time, instant runoff voting really is simple and elegant and, and effective. And I, to Gene's point, I mean, I think there you have to make a decision one way or the other. If they're daunted now with what's what's available to, from voting, then then beyond educating, there's not much you can provide that would even make it simpler. I mean, there's cakes and cookies available at these things. There's there's all sorts of incentives, and I think there's a variety of reasons why people don't vote. Not the least of which is ambivalence, um, and you can't you can't engender in any law or a charter the impetus to vote. You can only provide the means by which to do it and do it in a way that's effective that speaks to and represents the choice of the majority of the people. Other oh, people would like to speak on this issue? One last thing? Please. Okay. okay. I'd just also like to mention, I went to a bipartisan uh, panel on uh, voting reforms and things like this not that long ago. And one of the things that both, uh, all the representatives from different parties were able to agree on was adding a choice of none of the above to ballots. Um, and I think it would be a really good idea because if, um, like Owen did, said, um, we want the representatives to have as much information as possible. And if somebody says that they don't want any of these people, I think that provides a lot of information. So. <laughs> Let me add one last thing too. Uh, Northampton ele municipal elections are officially nonpartisan, uh, so there's no identification of a party or of a slate officially uh, in any of the ballots. Other people would like to speak within these area, within these two areas. 
moving forward, I turn it over to Gail Perlman, who are going to talk to us about available procedures for citizen access. Well, um, the way I want to divide this up is that we're going to be talking about four different um, procedures or methodologies for, for citizens having a voice in their government. But I want to talk about the first three as a group and then talk about um, the recall petition separately. And Dave's going to keep us on track here with 15 minutes for those first three, and then we'll leave 15 minutes for the second uh, discussion of recall. Um, the first of these uh, vehicles for access to the government is called the free petition. Our current charter does not have the free petition. The question we're asking to think about is whether or not we should add it to the charter. You should know that very few charters have it. Um, in the template that's been circulating among the committee, there's a signature threshold of, a, of 100 citizens. So. Um, we're really asking two questions here. Should we add it to the charter? And if so, is the 100 citizen threshold an appropriate number? The free petition is simply a request of the group of, of signing citizens for some kind of action by the city council or the school committee. I want to contrast that with the initiative petition. Um, which is also a request to the city council or the school committee for a particular action. The current charter has this provision. We have this method for bringing a question to the city council or the school committee. A citizen would only need it when a city councilor or a school committee member didn't by himself or herself bring the issue to the, to the deliberating body, to, to the council or the school committee because that's the way issues are usually brought to the council. This is an unusual um, method for, for, for a request to be brought to the council. In any draft that we'd be looking at, there would be requirements for the number of people needed to sign the petition. There would be um, questions of whether certain kinds of questions should or should not be brought in this way. Certain actions that the council or the school committee would have to take in processing the request. Um, and with the initiative petition, there's always a requirement for an election. So there may be a process that the school committee or the council goes through when it receives such a petition, but there um, will be an election on it if the council or the school committee doesn't, doesn't um, automatically accept it. Whatever we did, um, if we, if we um, um, retain this, pro this provision that we already have in the charter, whatever we did, the, the new charter language would sort of modernize the, would modernize the concept for, um, for, for modern days. Um, you should know that a significant majority of Massachusetts communities include this in their charters, but it's rarely actually used. So the questions for you are, should we retain this provision? Um, or not. It, the, the pros are that it provides access to elected officials, but it includes certain safeguards against um, frivolously broad questions, misuse or overuse. And there really are no cons um, to having this in, in the charter. The third um, method that we want to talk about is the referendum petition. This one is a very specific kind of petition that is brought by citizens to repeal a measure that's enacted by the council uh, or the school committee. The current charter has a referendum um, provision, so we would be asking whether we should retain it. Um, currently, the petition must be signed by 12% of registered voters, and then it appears on a ballot at the next regularly scheduled um, or special municipal election. The pros of maintaining the referendum petition are that it commonly appears in city charters and it's a, uh, it's a way that citizens can express their um, displeasure with a measure that's been enacted by the council. And again, there are no, no cons of, of any significance. So we're going to stop here and see if anybody wants to speak to any of these issues. Don't all
approach to the funding that work first, but is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to any of these three petitions? The free petition, three, three petitions, the free petition, the initiative petition, or the referendum petition? Yeah, could, you, could you just expand a little bit on what is the action that the council or school committee would have to take following an initiative petition? Um, as I'm recalling, I have to get all the, those notes out again. Um, um, the initiative petition um, number of signatures that are required. Yeah. Once the action is, is put forward by the council, the council then is required to take action on that and then it can go to a ballot question. Well, they have to That's take action, but they can they can accept it, right? They can accept it automatically. If they accept it, it's over. And if they don't accept it, then there's a certain number, there's a certain amount of time they have to get it to a, to a full election. Um, and I, those are the main steps. Yeah. One hand, if somebody would like to speak on this, please. Can you have a free petition along with the other ones? Like, can that just be an addition? Yeah, yeah there's no reason you can't have them all, but um, it's useful to think about the uh, relative ease uh, that the free petition gives mm -hmm. in comparison with the initiative petition, which puts a little bit more process into it. The, 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 um, um, higher number of uh, signatures and so forth. So right. it's that balance that we've been talking about in a number of issues here between easy access and um, not sort of disrupting the normal flow of government. Now, I do know that I've been working on a petition campaign, actually, and um, we're working on something for Amherst. And the number, the threshold to get something to their town meeting is very low. And I don't no, the I don't know if there is any like a lot of abuse or people in the town think that there is, um, but if that hasn't been investigated, I think it might be worthwhile because we're very similar cities. Um, the other thing is that I, I don't know. For me, I, at least from what I've seen with our society, is that there doesn't seem to be as much of a problem with too many people getting involved with government. So I think that making it easier isn't usually a problem. Well, the, the easiest way to get something on the agenda, the council is to go to your council member mm -hmm. and ask them to put it on the agenda. And you have a choice of your ward counselor and two at-large counselors. Um, in Amherst, they don't have counselors. So mm -hmm. that's a, it, it's part of the process over there to get an issue on the agenda. Here, I guess the question is if your counselor and the two at-large um, members aren't willing to put it on the agenda, does it deserve to be on the agenda? Um, understand there's there's already a mechanism for people to get issues on I, the agenda. Yeah, and I think that there's also something to say about the idea that uh, for a city council to introduce something, that's also a big political step for them. So if it's something that they might believe in, uh, they don't think might reflect on them politically, they might not be as willing to do it. Um, and I'm not trying to say that our any of our city councilors are heartless politicians, but it's been known to happen. So uh, I think that having a free petition, as it called, it sounds like a good idea. I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert on it. I have been uh, involved in different petition campaigns, and I think that having it be easier not be a bad idea. Also, just thinking about getting um, all the different populations in the city that might want to do a petition campaign. Um, 100 is a much. I don't think having it be an easier number would be a problem because canvassing, going door to door, as I think it was Bill Dwight that came up here and said, it's not easy. And so, you know, I think it's it'd be a worthwhile uh, addition to the charter. The distinction between the pre-petition and the initiative petition is that the initiative petition, if it if there's no action taken by the city council to pass, if it's not passed then it goes out to a vote at the next general election. So in other words, if uh, the, as opposed to the pre-petition, it just allows 
the matter to be discussed at the City Council and irrespective of the outcome, there's no further action that's required. So that's the distinction and it would be, between the two. But the, I'm not saying that you should get rid of the second one also, right. but it would just be the addition. Right. So to get it discussed, it would be an it's easier. It's non-binding. Yeah. 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 Okay. Other people who want to speak to those first three? Here. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I think in practice, uh, getting a counselor to take a position that you, something you feel strong about is, it's not as easy as you said, I can say from practical experience on some issues that I took seriously. So. Thank you. Other folks within the first three areas of petitions, if you'd like to speak to those areas. Gail, I think we can move forward. Then the last one we're, I'm going to discuss in this section is the recall petition. And this is the petition to remove from office an elected official before the end of that official's term. The issue for us is whether we should add this to the charter because it does not exist in the charter at this time. Um, it's interesting that eight cities have the recall provision, but 130 towns have the provision. Um, and um, historically, it's not used often in cities. When we asked our consultant about this, um, Steve said that the reason that he thinks it's um, uh, not used much in cities is that this is the kind of thing that small towns um, can kind of get their get their teeth around um, much more easily than a big city can, and he has talk about the um, kind of negative vibes that happen from this kind of a thing in a small town. So we just have to think about what the, uh, what the reality is and the difference between a town and a city as we're thinking about whether we should do <coughs> this. The pros of this are that it's a way to remove uh, an, an elected official from office if that official um, is not uh, performing properly, but the problem with even that word, those words, performing properly, is, is difficult because there are no standards um, written anywhere in any of these petitions that at least that Steve was aware of for determining um, who ought to be recalled. Um, so the pros are it's a way to remove someone from office, and it may have a greater significance if there are, if there's a longer term, that is if you have a short term and somebody is not performing properly, um, you can maybe kind of live with that until the end of the short term. But if it's a longer term, citizens may not be so willing to live with it. The cons, um, you know, ironically, um, the, same, um, the same statement that is a pro for the recall is a con, because it's a way to remove an elected official from office. And you know how people in our country feel about elections. They are, they are treasured. Um, events. And so to remove someone from an elected position is a very um, serious matter. It's an extreme remedy, and as I said before, there are no standards for figuring out whether or not to do it. So, any, uh, do we have a list for this? Or? No? Okay. Anyone like to speak to the recall initiative? <laughs> Mr. Dwight. Uh, a few questions, though. What What is the threshold? What's the process? The, someone submits a recall petition, you get 150 signatures, and bada boom, bada bing, that's it? Well, that's no. all of what we have to decipher out. One, should we have a recall provision? Right. Then the second step would be, what should the threshold be for that recall petition? And how, how much should it be? Should it be 30% of the electorate has to sign the, the recall? 30% of the people who voted in that last election where that person was elected? Should it be 5%? Should it be 49%? I mean, it's very difficult to figure out where you would draw that threshold line so it is clear for everyone. You don't want the person who just lost the race to mount right. a campaign to recall somebody in a sour grapes kind of situation. So, and because there is no language that says um, you, what you can recall a person for, it's a general blood based Someone doing a great job could be recalled. Okay, so it's a matter of trying to figure out how where that threshold is if you were to accept this provision. 
I think it was Mark who uh, described uh, a situation where someone can be recalled and then just run again, right. and then be recalled and then just run again. I, I don't think that's unprecedented either. But right. it's, 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 I mean, actually, to the the other petitions, I'm actually all in favor of every access point the citizenry has to to their local government. But at the same time, we're a representative government, and if that's undermined, at least in a frivolous way, I think there has to be some pretty high thresholds if this were to be implemented, because uh, just as you said, there's a lot of opportunities. Also, if you were talking about a two-year term, I don't know what the process is, how long the time takes, then of course it kicks in all the stuff that Tom was talking about, then when do you have the re-election and, and to replace the person, and, and um, you know, in what are the conditions in terms for which someone will qualify for a repeal petition? I mean, I think it'd have to be fairly egregious, given given the fact that, particularly on a council level, I mean, because as you said, it's hard to determine when. I mean, the voters more or less determine when they're doing a good job or a bad job. They really have to be doing something. I mean, borderline criminal in order to qualify. And if they're doing something criminal, then they're liable on it anyway. Uh, you don't need to worry about a recall petition. They hopefully be doing time. So I, 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 this this one seems this one seems like the opportunities, as you describe, the potential pitfalls, are might outweigh the benefits for citizen access. I think that if a counselor is failing in their duties, then the petition, the previous petitions that are mentioned, probably allow you to circumvent at least that counselor's. Uh, behavior in some level, but this one, this one's a little, this one seems a little draconian. Jesse, I would possibly support a recall petition. Please, please identify yourself. I'm sorry. Jesse Adams, uh, 187 Main Street. I would uh, probably support a recall petition if any of the two-year terms were extended to four years. I think then it might be sensible to uh, to, to make that trade-off. Thank you. I can think back about 40 years in the city of Northampton, and I haven't ever come across any uh, thing that was egregious enough for a recall petition. Um, so I don't know. I just the two-year terms. Uh, it's over in a heartbeat. By the time you get to running for this election, you're already campaigning again. So, and even if it went four years, I still over. As far as I can remember, I've never heard of any anybody that ever did anything that really needed them to be recalled. And what are the standards? What would it be? No, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. What can, like, how can a city councilor or a mayor, any any other elected official, how can they be removed by some other means, or so how? Other than like just waiting for the election. So say if somebody does do something, we I don't know the people consider not a very good decision. Unless oh. it's a criminal conviction, right? Like, uh, okay. Um, the other question I have is there are other cities and towns that use this. How often? Or is it well documented that it has been abused, or that there are have been many? I, I, I think it's very, very rare. I don't have any knowledge of abuse. Well, I, I think they're saying in the abuse. towns that it was abused. Wasn't that the word? That it was literally like the day after the election, the other side began minting, mounting a okay. recall um, petition. That was how it was described to us in some towns. Locally and, here in one community, <coughs> um, the the select board did not renew the contract of the, the police chief and there was a recall petition mounted immediately upon that decision. Um, Wisconsin has been going through lots of recalls right now. They uh, recalled, they had I believe eight or nine senators that were recalled. Half of them survived, half of them did not. Uh, they're currently in the middle of a recall battle over the governorship. Uh, because there are certain people who are 
disliked the decision and the direction he was taking the state. The same thing happened in California to Gray Davis. He was recalled to government. So it has happened um, where people have, their terms have ended early with this provision. The question is, should we accept that provision here to oust someone because they made a decision that we disagree with? There's a difference when there's a criminal involved or other malfeasance. That's a different sort of an area that can be recalled as well. But what we're seeing recently is for decisions that, that have been made by the elected officials, people are recalling them. Is that the correct vehicle? Should we have that as a source within our charter? Okay. Um, the That's other very question. tough because there, if there aren't any standards stated, um, and Steve has said it's almost impossible to state standards, then you run into this problem of are you, are you attempting a recall? because somebody has become unable to fulfill the position? Or are you mounting the recall because you just disagree with something that that person did who was elected by a majority in the jurisdiction? So it's, it, you know, it just becomes a very, um, I think it was Bill who said that. Um, if it was a clear way to write the standards, I think there would be a lot more consideration. It's just that it's very difficult to write this standard. And just another question for clarification. Is there any way for, if it's not a criminal matter, is there any way for the city council to um, I don't know, impeach a mayor, I guess? No. Okay. So They can have a vote of no confidence. They can vote against the decision that might have been made. Okay. They can be on record for that, I believe, Bill. And yes. But there is no way to actually overturn certain rules like that. Okay. There are ways that the city council can overturn decisions by the mayor, but not particularly that way. Okay. But not ousting the mayor. But, but not ousting the mayor. Okay. That's what I meant to say. Thanks. Other people would like to comment on the this question. area. Tom? Is there a provision in the charter now or in state law that provides if someone is convicted of a particular level of crime that they are no longer can serve? Yes. Is that in the charter? That's in the charter. It's in the charter. If they're convicted, they have to go. What uh, type of crime? Do they mean that? I believe they use the word felon, and it has to be that um, not that you've served your time, and that not you, I don't know what the word is, you're the lawyers. Steve said it was even before an appeal that you would be right. You would be required to step down. Yes, there isn't a barrier to people who have a previous felony from running for office. That's the distinction. Right? But if you incur a felony while in office, you're out. Other questions or comments in this area? We are moving right along, folks. All right. Uh, that is the areas that we wanted input in, the areas that we had flagged that um, we just needed some feedback. For those who are listening at home, if any of these are brain topics for you, again, we ask you to submit to Mary so we get it. But this is an opportunity for the last um, period of time. We wanted to schedule anything else on the charter that you'd like to talk about. And I return you to slide number three. Um, if you could, Mary. There were other areas on there, and I know Owen wanted to talk about it. Communications and special meetings, approval of the mayor, delegation of authority, modifying administrative boards and commissions. If you want to talk about any of those, this would be your opportunity to talk about that. Then in the last half, or the last portion of the time we have remaining, we'll let you go back to anywhere you wanted to talk about from the, the two public forums, anything else that you wanted to make sure got on record, any additional or second thoughts that you had. So, uh, anybody have anything they want to talk about now, please come to the podium, Owen. Evening again, Owen Freeman Daniels. Uh, really, I have two points. The first is um, that the power of the mayor to nominate uh, citizens to boards and commissions. I, I believe that there should be some process for uh, self-nomination or city councilors to nominate uh, citizens to boards and commissions. Um, just think that uh, 
oftentimes commissions and boards get a lot of the actual work done in the city and when the mayor has the power of who to put forward uh, although the council approves them the mayor has the power of who to put forward or whom to put forward I think that uh, that is a that is very um, great power and I believe that there should be some other method or mechanism by which uh, nominees for boards and commissions can uh, go forward. Could, could you outline some of those other methods? Uh, sure. Uh, nominated on the council floor and seconded. That's and then the council would vote between the mayor's nominee and... No, not nominee. necessarily. They'd be referred to... They'd go through the normal process of any nominee. They'd be referred to the... Um, the appropriate committee of the city council where you know they'd have to complete the same application and so on and so forth just as though whenever you have more than one nominee for one you know for one seat or what have you I mean it, it's uh, it, it can't be that complicated um, and I think it's definitely worth it to have more input as to who gets nom who, who you know whom is nominated uh, to sit on boards and commissions as one of our city councilors, if you could just actually drop a little bit of language for that for us to submit, just so we understand where you're coming from. I'd be happy to. Okay. The other piece, and I know I brought it up before, I'll just bring it up again in the public setting, or more public rather than before, was um, that I believe that the city council should be um, the final body to approve <coughs> fees on, uh, on utilities and uh, uh, other um, other funds, uh, uh, you know, other enterprise funds. Um, you know, as it stands now, many of those are approved by non-elected <laughs> boards, and uh, it, it's a fee, you know, it's, it's a user fee that often will fund capital projects, and I think that uh, you should have some uh, elected representative uh, setting the, um, at, you know, perhaps if it's the water rate or the sewer rate, uh, it, you know, you'd have the Board of Public Works make a recommendation, but then the actual approval is committed by the uh, City Council who are elected representatives. Could I just um, add what David said, if you could draw up a list, water, sewer, cable, you know, of the various areas that would that would apply. Sure. And, and are you talking all boards and commissions that should have uh, the ability to be nominated by someone other than the mayor? I'd have to check the language. I can't, I'm not sure about what any one that where the mayor nominates, I would also like to have some other process for nomination. Okay. Obviously, if it's uh, an election, you know, for CPC or something. That you know. <coughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Gene. Just a follow up on on Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, Applications are filled out in the, of the mayor's office, and the only ones that come before the council or to appointments and evaluations are the ones that she selects, and sometimes, or he selects, just one comes out. And we saw, we've seen that recently in our, in our Board of Health um, discussions. So I think I'd, love to, I'd like to see all the applications, uh, or, or the vast majority of them, come before the council, or, and they can be referred to appointments and evaluations, and it can and it can go from there, so I think that um, is one thing that probably should happen, and that it gives us a little more balance um, between the executive and the elected branch. So, you have a committee of appointments. And yes, we do. Council committee appointments and evaluations, and I do believe the board of public works should have quite a bit of autonomy in in their operations, <coughs> but I do think that water and sewer rates. Um, should come before the council. And they can actually come and make their pitch. Make their pitch why this has to go up and the council could, could approve or... Um. I'm not sure this goes in, oh, and you might want to respond to this too, but I'm not sure, is that really sensible in the case of water and sewer? I mean, it, doesn't that yield a little bit to political pressure just to keep fees low, even if that means deferred maintenance or inappropriate operations? Oh, I don't. Wouldn't the state otherwise regulate water and sewer as a public utility? No, it's, our, it's in our charter that the Board of Public Works will do it, I believe. Or it's an ordinance. Don't they have to meet certain stipulations for sustainability? The, the important information that fees can only be the equivalent amount of the cost of doing right. the particular operation. So they're not randomly and arbitrarily set politically or otherwise, theoretically. 
and I know that's may, there may be people who will play fast and loose with that, but by and large, the fees can only represent the cost of doing the particular well, that, That's my concern. If you bring it to the city council, doesn't that remove just the pragmatic cost of operations and bring it into a political discussion? I'm not sure it brings a, a political discussion. They can come on, they can just say that this is why we're doing this because the enterprise funds are regulated by the state on just exactly where you can use them and what you can do with them. Um, it gives the council a window into just exactly what's going on with the Board of Public Works. We have a conference committee also, a BP, DPW conference committee that myself and Councilor Adams are on. And, but that happens sometimes quarterly or and sometimes some things go by that we don't ordinarily get a handle on. So there's checks and balances, but I do think that if you're going to set water and sewerage, they can say why we need to do this, or at least come before the council and tell us why they're doing it, and not just arbitrarily do it. When the tax rate is set, that comes before the council for a vote? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, can Owen and Jesse, I know you're both passionate about this issue. Do you have anything you want to add to answer these questions? In response to Mark's point, we set you know we set the tax rate too, so I'm not sure if there's if, you know if, if that same concern exists there. I mean, to be what's the difference? Also, um, I just want to point out that reviewing the process of appointments and evaluations is one of the best practices recommendations. So I do think that's an that's an, uh, an important priority. Thank you. Yeah. And again, that best practices is part of the uh, log that we're keeping on this. Uh, yeah, I, I just I just want to make a comment about the uh, water and sewer rates. Um, don't want to pick on any particular enterprise fund, you know, uh, solid waste is another one. But uh, oftentimes, those funds they have um, they've got their own priorities. You know, they they maybe want to do equipment upgrades, uh, maybe they want to um, do design, you know, roll design costs. Uh, for new structure into uh, into the, the sewer and for water fees or whatever, and um, those priorities may be reasonable and they may not. Uh, and uh, you know the city council I think really sets budgetary priorities, and it's important for them to have some oversight on it. So at this point in time, those enterprise funds are run by those groups. Does the mayor even get to sign off on that, or city council? You're saying doesn't. That's correct. Does the mayor get to sign off? No, no, she no. Or public works. I don't think so. So it's just that body has the autonomy to set the rates. Okay. Understand? Other folks who want to speak on any of these issues, Bill and then Barry. Just uh, again, the point of information. There actually is a precedent as far as the the, the first thing that Owen was talking about, uh, where board members are elected by the council, and there are a number of uh, the board of health actually used to be that way. Anyone could come. And basically, put their name in a hat, and then they would come and make their case before a special uh, convening of the council, and the council would vote based on that. And and um, but you know there are a lot of boards, and there's a lot of committees, and I don't know. I mean, that would require a lot of energy and effort. Maybe that's a good thing. We still sign off on them on the council, but as as it's been pointed out, that you're basically saying yay or nay for someone that the, that the mayor is advancing if they're on, based on the recommendation. So it's it's not unheard of and it's not impossible to do. It, it can work effectively it, 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 and it, it gives the public another opportunity to, to at least see the vetting and the construction of, uh, of uh, citizen boards that do clearly have a, a great deal of impact and effect that aren't necessarily elected. Bill, how often, in your recollection, has a, somebody that's been proposed by the mayor not been accepted by the council? In my tenure, it's very rare. But then, of course, we've been accused of being bobblehead dolls. So, you know, that w without the capacity for for free thought. So, but the the fact is that it's 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 fairly rare. I mean, in fact, actually, part of the challenge for the mayor, as I understood, was coming up with enough candidates. Um, for various positions in some cases. But sometimes, I mean, clearly the planning board obviously has, holds more interest for a lot of people as opposed to some other committees. And so, and that is a very powerful committee and it has in most of the, you know, it accounts for most of the pressure points in, in community debates. 
And clearly there are people who would prefer to serve on the planning board who, and they think that there are other people who are serving on that don't represent their attitude. And maybe that would be an appropriate, that would certainly be an appropriate place where that type of uh, elected representative review would make sense, I would imagine. But you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. It's I agree. It's very hard to, to say these boards go through the city council, these boards don't. I just. It's, they have been parsed out in the past. They, they have been parsed out. And I don't know the criteria if you did that, mm -hmm. if you separated, and if you did in for a penny, in for a pound, that's a heavy pound. But, you know, it's a question of, you know, what's the community's will in this respect as far as a charter change. So. Well, that's homework for the folks that are listening. The rest of the people in the audience, if you have an opinion on that, please submit it. Barry, I saw your hand next. Uh, this. Uh, doesn't go to any one particular point, but it's overall. Um, I became concerned about this issue because I attended what was billed as an open hearing, and I got a card in the mail to come and attend the, the open hearing, in which I would, uh, the citizens affected by a proposed ordinance or the, a, a reversion of environmental protection laws would have a chance to speak up. And when I got to the meeting, uh, it was a done deal. The vote was taken right then and there. I had gone with the expectation that I would be learning about it so that over time a discussion would be going on. That led me to investigate just what the legislative process was in the city. And what I found out, uh, to my astonishment, was that the way that the city government actually works is everything is done in committee. You've heard it talk about whether city councils should get paid more or not. Uh, some work harder than others. But none of them are able to devote the amount of time necessary to understand every issue that comes before them. It's, it's just an impossibility. So what, where I'm going with this is that I'd like to see what you have done here makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you had just put up the cons against a given issue, when it came time for this, uh, voting, everybody would go, well, definitely we have to vote against it. Or if you just put up the pros on every issue, everybody would say, oh, of course, that makes perfect sense. Because the way it's presented is critical. And what is lacking in the operation of the city right now, and it's a major flaw, and it's why all best practices just get blown away whenever somebody wants something, is because the legislation comes up from the committees where you have special interests at the helms driving the proposed legislation. And they draft it. And when they present it to the city council, the city council just sees a list of pros. There's never a con against them. It's the same thing that goes on in the city, state, and the federal government. And it's part of the reason right now there's this incredible divide within the country because only one viewpoint is being presented. And more than that, it goes to why there's a lack of leadership at some issues locally and nationally. I have seen laws passed within the city council here that are just abhorrent. Or even if you agreed with them, you certainly should be able to recognize reasons for being against them, some sort of balance. But the way it's presented, everybody is afraid to talk on a particular issue out loud because of Facebook and everything else. If you take an unpopular decision, you will be ostracized. So how do we get around it? Well, you guys have a good idea right here, pros and cons. And what I think is imperative is that a means be presented that before any vote is taken in the city council, any legislation that is proposed, it be just like this, pros and cons. And that process would enable, as it bubbles up from the committees, people to be, would be able to come in at any point and take a look at the proposed legislation and what's going on and pick up the cause. I know that Owen Free and Dan Daniels was involved with the zoning <coughs> session uh, down on, on King Street, and he wanted to open it up to discussion. Well, he experienced exactly what I experienced. After he brought in uh, business people to talk about the subject, at the last minute they brought in a committee, the committee president who said, look, you can't touch this. It's all been discussed. If you change one thing, then the whole thing has to be thrown out. And that's the way the city works. And the other thing is, like I say, you cannot take an unpopular position. I think they wanted to legalize marijuana. 
I can see reasons for it. For me, that's insane. But I, I, I bet you if it came to a vote in our city, it would pass because people would be afraid to oppose it. And therefore, again, I think it's imperative that starting in the committees, when legislation is brought up, a record be made of it and it be put made into a rule. Pros and cons. A history be, be presented up to, of it so anybody could come in, add to it, and that pros and cons, just like you're doing, exactly the way you're doing it here, uh, allow people's inputs to come in from people who listen and that be put into the final document. And when the law is passed, let it say, whereas, and put all the pros, and then also list all the cons. So that if it comes up for a debate in the future of questions, it's not like you're the bad guy for challenging it. There's a record of points and a record of reservations of why something was or wasn't done. Thank you for the compliment, Barry. And, and I just want to point out, there, the, what we're looking at in the charter is that there's a lot now in the charter that might need to be in the code or in the ordinances. And I'm not sure where that particular piece falls. We'll bring it back to committee and we'll discuss it more. But I'm not sure where that goes. Um, we're looking to streamline and take things out of the charter that probably shouldn't be there. Um, so I take note of it and we'll figure out where it goes, where you plug it in. Other people who would like to speak on those issues you see up on the board? Please. Um, again, I'm not sure if this would be something you could do through the charter, but uh, I know you talked about um, term limits for the city council and mayor and also school committee. But if you could also do term limits for uh, people on city boards and committees, I think that we, there is a lot of power in boards and committees, and even though they're not, they're not elected, which for the people that oppose the term limits for the city council and all those other positions, they... One of their big arguments is that we have term limits that are called elections. We don't have that for those boards and committees, so it's even more of an imperative to me. Um, and I also don't think it would be that uh, large of a problem. I think that they are, you know, if you have somebody serving on a board or committee for over 10 years, yes, they have the experience and the knowledge, but I think even if they're no longer on that committee, if that knowledge is really needed, they're, they're accessible. Those are, most of these things are volunteer positions, they're not getting paid. So it's not like they're going to be like, oh, I'm not going to talk to anybody else. So having a term limit will uh, spur new ideas, new people. It will help uh, get, a, you know, a representative amount of people from the community. Um, so I think it should be something that you consider in the charter. Okay, moving forward, other people who would like to comment on any issue now. Um, regarding the city charter. Anything that you want to bring up, this is your time. Gene. I will bend your ear for one more minute. Because I heard a lot of people talk about uh, taking unpopular positions and that you talk about recall and you talk about um, all of these things that would affect the decision that you might make that would actually hinder what you're supposed to do as a city councilor. And I had to go through my notes since the last meeting, and I had about 80 people on my ward alone, and that doesn't include all the other wards in the city, that had asked me to do something that was hugely unpopular and was not going to pass as they wanted. And that was a CPA ballot initiative. It required only 5% of the city's registered voters to put that on the ballot. Never in a million years did I suspect, given the history of the city of Northampton, the generosity that the city has, has shown through any override for anything that they could sink their teeth into, such as the high school or any, the police station, I could go through all the overrides that have happened in the city. Never in a million years did I think that the CPA was going to go away. It just wasn't going to happen. So. But it was hugely unpopular. It was a very small percentage of the registered voters that contacted me and wanted that to go on the ballot. And I was hammered with calls. Maybe I was the only one that would put it on the ballot, that would actually bring it up or, or do anything with it. And I actually assisted them. I wrote the ballot question. I wrote three. Two of them were rejected. And one of them was accepted by uh, the Elections Division. It had to be exactly in the exact 
way that it was adopted, which was through a signature petition, and it had to be worded pretty much the same, except we had to put repeal in. It kept coming back. So just think. They could have said, let's recall Tacey because he wants to put the CPA on the ballot. But that was what my job was. I was hammered by my constituents and constituents that weren't even mine throughout the city that said, let's do this. So I wrote it. And I, you can't imagine the number of hours we put in for this Bean Allen Farm, which was all CPA money. But this was an unpopular stance that I took as a city councilor. I did what my constituents asked, and then put it out there and let it go and see what happens. And so in the division of the city, whether it's the fours or the, for, or the against, the, the pros or the cons, if you talk about the division in the city, what everybody should have done, they should have embraced this question and not created an even bigger divide within the city. They should have said, let's see just exactly what the people are thinking about what the CPA has done. And look at it. Look at how it came out. And I'm still happy as hell that I, that I put that question together and put it on the ballot. It let us know just exactly what was going on with the CPA and what the voting public thought. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share anything at this time? Please. Okay. Lida Lewis, 39 Myrtle Street. Um, the recall petition, I can't see any advantage to it that isn't outweighed by the potential for abuse. That's one thing. Um, and the other is from last time. I've been thinking a lot about the city clerk and the elected appointed thing. And I want to come down on the side of appointed. Um, and the reason that I didn't before is because I'm a huge fan of the incumbent. But that's not what we're supposed to be talking and thinking about. Um, I don't see any advantage to having it stay in elected position. I see a lot of advantage to having it be appointed. So that's, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Are we back into the November meeting? Yes, we've, we've now opened it up to anything in the charter. I'm going to keep that parameter up, the charter. <laughs> We're not talking about the Red Sox season. The charter. <laughs> or Celtics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, appointed and elected in the, uh, the, the city clerk's office. Uh, I go to different department heads and I ask certain questions and I get documentation uh, from many department heads. And I can almost set my watch. If the, if the position is appointed, I can sit on the bench <laughs> in the first floor of city hall and watch and just see the minutes that go by before that particular person runs up the stairs to the executive's office to say, Councillor Tacey or Gene Tacey just came in and got this, 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 and this, and go away. I can go into an elected person's office, and I don't have to worry about that. There is no, nobody owes anybody anything, because they got elected. They, didn't, they weren't appointed. So it goes right back to appointments and the evaluations. It goes right back to the, the committees. Geez, if I was the mayor and I asked, look, would you put in for this committee? Bill Shear puts in for this committee. I say, I'll get it for you. I've got 10 applications here. I have just passed Bill Shears off to the city council, and that's it. This is a hypothetical, I, by the way. It's, it's hypothetical. It's not yeah, hypothetical. But that's the way it works. So anyway, uh, I am all for keeping the city clerk's uh, position elected. It's just a little bit of a balance. I do agree we did change the treasurers. Following your logic string, if we were to go to a different system of elections and appointments, which would include somehow the city council, would that make a difference if this, with the city clerk being appointed or being elected? Because the appointment process now would be different. It wouldn't come necessarily just from the mayor's office. Would that make a difference in how you would treat that? Because you said it would make a difference for other appointments. Yeah. Then, then you're going to get it within city government. You're going to get that decision made within the city government. 
I, the city your clerk. peers are going to vet yep. and approve the city council candidates, city clerk candidates. Would that make a difference in your your I'd, support of it? No, I'd want it elected by the general public. Okay, I just want to make sure that was clear because yeah. you're I wanted to follow your logic straight. Absolutely. So. Thank you. Barry. Um, I just want to uh, say that I agree with what Jean just said. Um, I did. I was asked by a person running for mayor to go and get the votes, and uh, when I went to the city hall to the city clerk, I was expecting to get a runaround as I had on occasions where I had um, dealt with mayoral aides, um, and uh, because I was shocked at how cooperative the person was and relieved to, to just be given instantly the vote tallies. And it was afterwards that I learned that she was elected, and I realized, oh, uh, that probably has something to do with it. So uh, my, my, my experience is the same as Jean's. Bill Dwight. Look, I'm, I'm really upset about this Bobby Valentine pointing to the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> it's just running crazy. I speak more holistically. This is actually, I want to emphasize how important it is what it is that you're doing and how critical it is for community input. I mean, it was one of the conversations, one of the driving conversations in the last several elections, not just this one, was issues that all directly relate back to the the charter issues that no one necessarily knew that they were talking about charter issues at the time they were just they were usually talking personal politics for the most part and and I have to say I'm a little disappointed with the, the amount of public turnout and the fact that I'm one of the principal speakers and that in fact actually many of the principal speakers happen to be elected officials who could be projected have some vested interest but the fact some of the things, for instance, that Barry was talking about, the issues of trying to, uh, I, I don't know, lower the potential for negative feedback, thereby making counselors or representative governance more courageous in their behavior, implying that they are now rank cowards, I disagree with that. I think actually that, and in fact, actually, I don't, I don't think there's a seated a seated counselor that I've known throughout the history who hasn't made at least one or two controversial uh, uh, decisions, choices, or advanced particular causes without too much fear of recrimination on Facebook or anywhere else. I mean, the thing about this community is that we do accept, despite what some people say, we accept conflict and difference. We think that's the stimulus that creates good governance. And what you are all charged with is creating and drafting for us to vote on, hopefully, potentially at the next election, is the document that defines how it is we go about doing that in a way that, that presents us with the best government. We're currently, as you noted, I'm just preaching the choir here, but we're working on a document that was crafted at a time when circumstances were vastly different. And, and a lot of the problems that we're running into are all brought by the passage of time, the changes of culture, the changes of the way we function in our daily lives. And so I, and I hope that as this goes forward, and, and clearly, obviously, this becomes, if it does pass muster and gets out of the legislature and comes up for a vote, clearly there will be public conversation and participation in those debates. That is my, my fervent hope. But, I, but to that end, I'd just like to say congratulations and thank you all for your efforts at this. Bill, can I ask you a question? As, as an elected official, I've never served on a committee like this. You were faced with what the Gazette, I think, labeled wonks and watchdogs who have right. come up here and articulated quite well their opinions about these issues. But we haven't heard from the 99.9% .9 of the population. Um, how, as an elected official, do you weigh the wonks and the watchdogs versus the silent majority of people out there when you go to make your decision? I, I think it's one of the principal challenges of representative government. And, and in fact, is when I ran for office, and I think when others run for office, and the, the point that you make is I'm not going to predicate my vote based on how many phone calls or emails I get. Basically, I, what you, when you run for rep as a representative, you present yourself and your tendencies, your beliefs, your, your ethos. And ask investment from the from the constituents whether they that works for them. If 
your ethos applies and you are going to trust, trust that person's judgment. It is very frustrating. You speak of the frustration that I just spoke of as well, is, is the level of participation. Because a lot of people complain that they, they weren't part of the discussion and the debate. And, and part of the frustration is, is, one, getting the word out and, and generating enough interest. Um, and at the same time, knowing you know full well, and I guarantee this is going to happen, Regardless of what you come up with, and as a ballot initiative, there will clearly be said, I, this is a promise, that there wasn't enough opportunities to speak to this. And, um, and, and there does, there just, it's, it's, it's part of the, I, I guess it's the nature of the beast, but clearly it's not, that isn't the way to say, okay, we've done our level best. The thing is, is we keep striving to do as best we can to get as much participation and engagement. Uh, you know, let's face it. This is this is boring TV for most folks, and this is and we we have a lot of we have plenty of opportunities for distraction, and unfortunately, this is not a shiny object. And e e I, I wish it were on some level because it would be, it would I think it would manifest as a document that ultimately represented at least a, a heated debate. Um, but such as it is. This is what we got. I think I, I, that's why I, I commend you all for signing up or being, being you know, bullied into this. But it's you've done good work, and I know a lot of the work that's gone behind it. And you know, I, we have other battles to fight, and it's just that you guys are defining the the, the playground rules, and that's I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Elizabeth, I see your hand. Hi, Elizabeth Silver, Florence Mass. Um, nice little intimate room left over here, but um, I, I echo Bill's words and I commend all of you. And um, I want to say something more general, and I, this is probably completely unnecessary, but I, I just think it, it bears saying. I sat through most of the last session and pretty much all of this session, and I've noticed that a lot of the comments that are directed to uh, this body are a direct reaction to recent um, officials, recent elections, uh, and practices. And I think, and I think you know this, it's really, really critical that in the examination of these very important issues, that all be put aside. Um, it, you know, there's a conversation about does the council president take over running the meetings, and we heard three incredibly eloquent statements last time from Pat Goggins, Mary Ford, and Bill Ames um, that ran counter to the general sentiment, which I think was largely born, not entirely, but largely born as a reaction to our prior mayor. And regardless of how people feel about individuals, this body needs to make decisions that are going to be going forward for however long this charter lasts and before the next review. So I think um, it, it behooves all of us to think about how we want the process to work without regard to the personalities. And that, that applies equally to appointment of the city clerk. It applies to appointment of the boards. Separate out the individual who in the past has done this from the decision we need to make as a city. So um, I know that there have been a few people with very unpopular positions, but I think those are really important ones to hear and not to act and react um, out of um, individual personalities, but as a principle that can guide our city forward. Can, so. can I just ask you a follow-up question to that? Sure. Just because this is what I mean, I'm just trying to really um, distill, you know, what people are thinking. So. so after I heard, I agree with you that the room <clears throat> on the question of um, the mayor presiding over city council, I would say that the, the room was really like, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, Mary Ford got up and said, wait a minute, you know, it's, it's, we don't have this strong mayor, that's an illusion. But, so. The question that I thought about afterwards was trying to put aside the trying to put aside the individuals that people are referring to in the situations 
don't that that a, a type of personality or um, that a type of personality or a type of intellect could take what was perceived to be at least so much power isn't that a reflection of the of the playground rules like Bill is saying do, do you see what I'm saying or you think that that's a total anomaly that had nothing to do with the playground rules? Because I agree totally with what you're saying. Let's not react to the, to the player. We're, we're talking about the player. Right. So we need to step away from the player. And right. I think in that question, there's a premise that I'm not sure I agree with. Okay. And that, you know, it would have to be parsed out. But I don't think that's my position. Um, I mean, I, I, th I, think that. That, I think that we heard some very clear voices suggesting why having the city council president run meetings may not be the wisest for the council in terms of its efficiency and its running. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard the potential for discord. We heard the potential for conflict. We heard the potential for fights. Um, so, you know, while up and down the line there was city council president do, should do this, um, and I'm, I'm not stating my position here because, honestly, I'm not really sure how I feel about yeah. that. I, I just want it divorced from the personalities that we've seen recently yeah. and, and, and very improperly admonishing this body to do that because I know you know that you should be doing that anyway. So I'm just putting my two cents about that. Um, sorry to, to, to press you if you don't feel your, your <laughs> thoughts are that fully fleshed out. You can talk about anything. <laughs> but, if we can remove this from the personalities, I mean, it seems to me that the broader question is, do you want to maintain the current structure where you have a, at least a relatively strong mayor, um, where perhaps decisions can be made quicker, more efficiently, um, and that is coupled with a two-year term. So maybe you don't have lots of checks and balances you got to check checks and balances along the way, but you got to check and balance ultimately at a two-year mark to, to, to check the public on. Or do you want power to be much more diffuse than it is right now to ensure checks and balances all throughout the process, um, but do you risk having uh, a less efficient and effective process along the way that you didn't need to have because you already have a two-year term with an ultimate check and balance? Uh, and, it, and can we weigh that divorce from just the last six years, can we talk about it in what's a general good practice for a town of this size? Do you have a sense of which is the better strategic way for a town of this size to go? Well, you certainly articulated the tension perfectly. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I believe in representative democracy, you know, and the whole question tonight about the, the petition process, that has muddied the works in so many places, it's bogged down. I mean, there was a constitutional convention that including a limitation on the, the initiative process in Massachusetts. And, you know, you can only look to California to see how difficult something like that can be. <coughs> At the same time, it can work wonderfully where, you know, depending on your um, political views, you know, when you recall the, the person in Arizona who's come up with horrendous immigration laws, <coughs> I think that's a good thing, but that's just my personal political view. And so, you know, you have to separate that out from the process and efficiency, which is exactly the question you're posing. As I come back to, I believe in representative democracy. People, you know, I thought it was Bill's, but he said it wasn't his line about, you know, term limits being elections. And I, we elect representatives to represent us, and I want that to happen. And I want city government to operate smoothly and efficiently. There is obviously a balance of process and citizen input, which is always critical and important. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I think I'm going to throw this back at you guys because, <laughs> I mean, I think the system has worked relatively well and we've done some really, really great things in this city. Um, so I understand the arguments on both sides of these issues. Um, and if I felt very strongly one way or the other, I would say so. But I feel more like we, it's just much more important to weigh those 
you know, balances and come up with something that will continue to assist this running the city to run as efficiently as it has. Todd, you had a quick question? Yeah, I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, what we're trying to gra grapple with and balance are best practices, um, which is sort of an ideal of how the ideal city should be run. We've got to counterbalance that with politics. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, our consultant, has told us that it would be very risky to put the city clerk question on the ballot because it might jeopardize all the other work we're trying to do. And that's just the facts. And that, that we, we, we need to balance that. There's also the pragmatic side. If we um, shift more responsibility to the council president, that's going to increase their workload. That's going to limit, perhaps, the number of counselors who are able to serve. Do we need to pay more money to make that a full-time position? Do we need to hire staff? So there's that pragmatic element. And just so the audience is aware, we're trying to sort of balance this and find an elegant solution to give the best outcome for the city. And it's, um, I know everyone has strong opinions, but all the input you can offer uh, to help us you know, find that path is, is helpful. So that's all. Again, my thanks to all of you for this hard <coughs> work. Thank you, Leslie. Um, we are done way early, so let me ask the question three times and hearing. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment on anything regarding Northampton's charter? Barry. I could just like to uh, just because Councillor Dwight, I think I misrepresented what I said. Um, I'm not questioning the bravery of the councillors. I'm just saying that in order to make a proper decision when the the um, explanations come up for legislation. They present both sides of it because the councils will not have had sufficient time to investigate what was done within the committee. And as things stand right now, they only get one viewpoint, essentially. And the second thing is uh, people are people. Um, and they are, and politicians in particular, are sensitive to, how, to what the community feels. So in our community, a uh, progressive position, which is in keeping with Bill Dwight's general positions, that will fly. It doesn't take much bravery to put this out, put that out. It takes a lot of bravery to, to take a right-wing position in our community. You'll never hear it spoken up in our community, except to some extent, Gene Tacey taking a conservative fiscal position. And I would like to hear those positions. And if nobody has the nerve to speak up in front of the camera uh, like this, it's understandable. But if you could, but you're planning for the next hundred years, Get the computers to take in the information and put the inputs up, the cons and pros, on a given issue. It's a good thing. Uh, that's it. Uh, yeah, no, you guys did a great job. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, please, come on up. Identify yourself and where you're from. Hi. I'm Mike Janik. I live at 44 Penn Castle in Florence. I'd just like to thank you again. I'd like to thank the media and CTV, uh, Northampton Media. Uh, in the paper, uh, the Gazette. They've done a great job. You guys have done a great job. I watched you on TV last week. I wasn't able to be here. Um, I think what you're really charged with is uh, finding a good check and balance for our charter and also doing the best practices and including all citizens in the process. And I, I uh, commend you for all you're doing and I look forward to see what actually you come forward with. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Since you said you were done way early, <laughs> you still had plenty of time. Uh, the, the, the mayor chair and the, uh, the, city, the city council, um, you know, and, and take the personalities. Elizabeth is right about the personalities that are involved there. But if you write it into the charter, you can eliminate that happening again. Thank you. Lana, identify yourself. Welcome back. Thanks. I only came because she said she was going to be done to be picked up. So, <laughs> but I've been watching it. Always my fault. There's this one speaker I'm really fond of. But. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Mimi Adgers, Glendale Road. Um, I just want to, a couple of things. The first was uh, you were talking about recall, putting in a recall option. Uh, if we continue with the current trend of two years terms. I don't see a need for a recall election. I think that by the time you launch the recall and get it all done, the person's term would probably be halfway over anyway. Um, so I'm not really for the recall uh, option. I also think it could be abused. Um, I just think there's too much of a potential for that. 
And again, unless you were going to lengthen the terms to four years, then it could be a potential to use it. Um, but two years just seems such a short time. Um, making elections more accessible, having like the, the runoff ballots, I'm definitely in favor of that. I think it's a more democratic option. Gives people, uh, just, you know, I just feel like it, it create, it's, a, it's a more dem democratic way of doing things. I'd love to see it happen in our national elections because I think it would give rise to the third parties, you know, al alternate parties. Because oftentimes we read in the paper where people say, don't throw your vote away, vote for this person. Even if you don't really like him, you don't want the other guy. Well, you know, I'd like to be able to vote for the person that I firmly believe in and not feel this pressure to, you know, in, in, in one way you still are throwing your vote away if you're voting for someone you don't believe in. So I definitely feel so very strongly about that option. Um, and I think the other thing was, I'm trying to remember all the stuff I listened to you say. <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to remember, so I won't waste their time. Thank you. Amy, please submit it if you do come up with it. Um, going through my litany, is there anyone else who'd like to speak at this time? Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at this time? Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at this time? Hearing none, we're going to, we're going to move on with the rest of this form. I turn to the next to last slide. Target dates to submit reports to the City Council is January 13th. We have to send them something, which means we're on a really fast track our actual from our first meeting date until we have to submit something is 90 days. So we are moving very quickly. We're going to have a meeting on the 14th of December in City Hall. Okay, I do have a typo there. Thank you for picking that up. Uh, the January 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th um, is going to be uh, a marathon meeting where we're going to literally go through the charter, the uh, boilerplate as it was suggested plugging in our decisions in those areas, which will actually be recommendations. Um, then on the 17th, we're going to meet to talk about what we want to present to the City Council, but we'll be sending that document off on the 13th. And then on the 19th, which is what's wrong up here, January 19th, my apologies. Um, <coughs> the Friday, is it Friday? Thursday. Okay. Uh, January 19th is when this, we will be actually presenting the formal document, even though they will have it had it in their hands. This will all be posted on the website. Uh, the next, to, uh, the last page itself, input saw. Anything you might have heard tonight, you've had better reflections on, you want to add to it, you want to augment your comments. Anyone at home who would like to add any of this, we need your input. We've heard from maybe 100 people. Uh, the course of these two hearings and some written testimony. There are 28,000 other people in this community who have not responded. Uh, we need to hear from you so we can better assess the decisions that we're going to have to make. Send them to Mary. Her email address is up there. Please let us know. Any other business to come before this group at this time? Hearing none, a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Thank you all for your participation. Enjoy the rest of your evening.